Hi guys, today we're going to look at answering uh, and marking the Unit 3 Crime and Deviance with Theory and Methods paper. I'm looking at the 2016 specimen, which won't be available for students on the AQA website just yet, um, but I have gone through all the questions and items on this PowerPoint, and those my students will have access to this on the shared area on Firefly. Uh, so this is what the front cover is going to look like, apart from the word specimen, it'll have the actual date of your exam, time allowed, details about the paper, it's out of 80, and those car questions carrying 10 marks and more should be answered in continuous prose, but it's worth remembering that those are worth less than 10, so the 4 and 6 can be answered in um, bullet points, which is always worth remembering for structuring the length of your answers. So the first question I've asked you to look at is this one. Outline two ways in which the law may perform an ideological function for capitalism. 4 marks, 6 minutes. Uh, this is taken straight from the mark scheme. I'm not going to read through each of those bullet points with you, um, but if you can pause and have a read through. And then underneath is an example answer from uh, a marked example that's online that I can access. So have a read through. Working class believe laws are for their benefit. For example, health and safety laws are seen to protect workers, but they actually keep workers healthy to make profits for the ruling class. That's one point. Second point, there is selective enforcement of laws. This means crime is seen as being perpetrated by the working class. So using the mark scheme above, how many marks out of four would you give that question? And then can you please use that mark scheme to mark your own paper uh, or your own attempt at this question? Question two is asking you to outline three reasons why some groups are more likely than others to be the victims of crime. It's a six mark question, so again you can answer in bullet points and you should spend about nine minutes. I don't think you need nine minutes for this question, but that's the limit you have. So again, I'm not gonna read through every single one of these bullet points with you. I will say, as with the previous question, it is important to identify the reason and to elaborate on it, okay? So that point first one, women are more likely to be the victims of sex crimes. Uh, that's the point. This is because of the nature of the patriarchal society which makes them more likely to be the victims of rape. And the next one, males are more likely to be the victims of violent crime, and you can link this to any of these ideas. This is what positivist victimologists have found, edge work research has found, the nighttime economy suggests they're more likely to um, undertake behaviour such as drinking that will cause them to be the victims of violence. You need to go into that much detail in order to get the full two marks for each point. It's out of nine, so you've got to make three points. So using that mark scheme, have a look at this example response, which is in the sort of dark blue. Uh, the mark scheme's underneath it. Uh, how many marks out of six would you give this particular response? Young people are more likely to be victims of crime. Point. This is often violent crime or theft, and maybe because they are more vulnerable. That's the elaboration. Is it enough? Women tend to be the victims of domestic violence more often than men. This is often due to men exerting power over women in a domestic sphere to overcome the lack of status in the public sphere. Is that a clear point in identification? And finally, older people may be victims of abuse and mistreatment, particularly if they live in care homes where they may not feel able to report the treatment they receive. Now that point isn't in the mark scheme, but is it correct? And is there enough there for two marks? So if you can mark that one out of six, and then have a go at marking your own when you've answered it. Next question is your first ten marker in this paper. And as I've mentioned in class, I do think globalisation is going to come up because it is the new topic on the, the new papers. This asks, asks you to um, apply material from item A Analyze two reasons why globalization may lead to an increase in crime. 10 marks, spend 15 minutes on this question. It's really worth spending a few of those minutes planning and using the item. And I can't stress enough how much AQA wants you to be using the item for these 10 mark questions. Okay? So, 
let's read the item. I've highlighted the points that I think are useful. Uh, globalization is a process by which the world is becoming increasingly interconnected. I've highlighted that and I moved over to the right hand side. What points can you make about it being increasingly interconnected that might lead to an increase in crime? Think about what sorts of crime. Okay. One cause of increased interconnectedness is the development of the internet and global communications technology. Again, I've taken that out on the right hand side. In what ways has the internet and global communications technology, that includes media, social media, all kinds of uh, technology, let's uh, do the communication obviously, how have they created more opportunities for brand new types of crime? And is there any crime that's always existed but is now perhaps using the internet as its alternative medium in order to get some of its criminal material across? So think how the internet and global communications has made certain types of crime more common and even invented brand new crimes. Globalisation is further developed by the deregulation of financial markets. I've highlighted that there in green. The minute you hear financial markets, you should be thinking white-collar crime. So what types of crime and why has it become much more easier? See if you can remember a specific example that illustrates that. And the availability of cheap air travel. So because of cheap air travel, uh, clearly that means people are moving around the world more. So what types of crime might increase because of, you know there's more tourism? So what crimes might increase with tourism? And can you think of any crimes that might actually take place because people are travelling around the world with things with them? Or are they travelling to places to act criminally? Can you think of any examples? Uh, one, of the impact, one of the impact of globalisation is an increase in inequality between rich and poor countries. So what crimes, what illegal activity might be happening because some countries are much richer than poorer countries? Arguably, that's even happened within Europe. So what sort of crime is happening? Some people wouldn't call it a crime, maybe. But what sort of crime is more likely because of inequalities between rich and poor countries? You need to structure both of your points around the item. Uh, I said there, don't forget to analyse your points. So try and think, to what extent have actually some of these things really increased crime? You don't need to go into much detail about the evaluation element because it doesn't ask you explicitly, but they are looking for some element of an awareness that necessarily, like, so for example, uh, the internet might not have just created crime, it could possibly have solved crime. And try and think of an, the interconnections between the different elements of globalisation. So there is a connection between uh, the deregula deregulation of financial markets and increased inequality, for example. What interconnections can you identify? Here's the mark scheme. Okay, so the apply and analyse 10 mark mark schemes will ask you, okay, if you look at your AO3 in green, uh, for appropriate analysis, analysis slash evaluation of two reasons. It'll ask you to go into a lot more depth, okay, than the outline and explain top 10 mark questions. Okay, so just be aware. Even though it doesn't ask you explicitly to evaluate, it is asking you to be somewhat critical. And as I said to you before, uh, the four to seven band, if you do one epic point, you can get seven out of ten. Okay, just 1.7 out of 10. Or if your two points happen to be too similar, you will only be given a maximum of 7 for one point because you can't be credited for this, a same or similar point twice. So, let's have a look at How many marks for? Taylor argues that globalisation has produced greater inequality both between and within countries. This means that some countries have become richer whilst other countries have grown poorer. In addition, within all countries, inequality has grown as first world countries have tr transferred production to less developed countries where wages are cheaper and other things like health and safety are reduced. The inequality in the West has created pockets of relative deprivation. Whilst the poor can see wealth in the media, they cannot attain it and they turn to crime to gain it. This is referred to in the last sentence of item A. In addition, according to Beck, we live in a global risk society. This means that we have become more fee fe fearful sorry, of a range of national and international threats due to the media which sensationalises these stories. The fear which is created by this global panic produces an increase in hate crime. So have a look at those two points. 
look at the mark scheme, what would you give this out of 10? I think you can see that one point is clearly stronger than the other. Try and think why, try and think what they could do to the second point to give it a higher mark. And then have a go at marking your own 10 mark question. There's the question in the mark scheme um, for band, top band and middle band anyway, uh, for you to have a go at marking. Question four is your 30 mark question. You need to make sure that you leave 45 minutes for this question. At least five minutes of that should be planning. Don't forget, after this 30 mark question, you still have a 10 mark and a 20 mark question on theory and methods. Don't forget. Key skill again is to use the item. Um, so I'll read through the item and I've picked out some key ideas here that maybe you can develop in your own notes. Um, so, sorry, the question. Applying material from item B and your knowledge evaluates sociological explanations of ethnic differences in offending and criminalisation. Just quickly to refer you to the fact that it's talking about offending and criminalisation. In your introduction, you should clearly explain what's the difference between actual offending and criminalisation. Uh, with criminalisation being the idea that they are criminalised unfairly by the police, the media, the public, etc. So, at each stage of the criminal justice process, so highlight that, what are the stages, what are the patterns and statistics you can recall for different ethnic minority groups? I would encourage you to talk about more than just the black ethnic minority group and the variety within that. Try and think about patterns about for Asian, for example, uh, criminality uh, or offending. And can you think of it, how that compares with the white population, for example? There are differences in the experiences for different ethnic groups. For example, members of some ethnic groups are more likely than others to be arrested and convicted. I've picked that again. Which ethnic groups are far more likely to be arrested and convicted? And what are the different sociological explanations uh, the two sociological explanations fall into two camps. There's the one camp that says, yep, they are more criminal. So try and think which theoretical perspectives in particular would argue, or studies, sorry, would agree that certain ethnic minority groups are more criminal. And then there's the other side of the argument saying that, no, they're being, they're being criminalised unfairly. They're being labelled, stereotyped, moral panics, all those kind of arguments. Try and remember who argued that and annotate that on the item. <clears throat> Studies also show that some ethnic minority groups are more likely to be identified as perpetrators by victims. Can you remember why that might be? So why do victims seem to remember, why do you think victims are more likely to wrongly remember their perpetrator, the criminal who acted against them, as being from an ethnic minority group? What sorts of things might be influencing their, their views, for example? And by the way, the research has shown that they sometimes, quite often, sorry, can identify their perpetrator wrongly as from an ethnic minority group. Um, then, when you, once you've had a discussion about that, you need to think about what impact will this have on statistics on offending in, and what impact will this have on criminalisation, the behaviour of the police, the media, etc. And that's where you develop your analysis, by the way. So, this time, I am... Oh, sorry, here's your mark scheme for that. I've picked out the top two bands and your uh, top middle band purely because as I've been talking in lesson the 13 to 18 band is the one I'm quite concerned about because that's where it says evaluation sorry at the very bottom of the slide evaluation will take the form of juxtaposition of competing positions you need to make sure that you are not doing that type of evaluation and you're developing a clear chain of reasoning and developed evaluation Moving upwards, uh, 19 to 14 bracket, you've got to be really cautious uh, here because this is where you end up if you do broad or deep. So you do a range of points, but you don't go into much depth, you end up here. Or you do a limited range of points, but they're in a lot of detail, you might end up here, as long as your evaluation is more developed and much more uh, along the lines of a chain of reasoning and not juxtaposition. Likewise, the top uh, band is looking for the wide range and the depth. Everything to be applied and evaluation to be explicit and relevant to the question and not going off on a tangent. So here's our example answer for you to have a look at. This one I'm not going to read through with you, so please pause the lecture at this point and read through.
So on this slide, I've annotated a mixture of my points and the examiner points um, about each of the paragraphs. Um, that top paragraph um, is generally got good evaluation, um, okay application to the question, although it isn't explicit at the end. It does make two points within that one paragraph, and they sort of flow quite nicely from one to the other. Okay, so that from to me is a good sort of chain of reasoning within that point. Um, second paragraph. <clears throat> Um, despite such changes in the laws, that's a clear link to the previous point, again forming that chain of reasoning, the logic of the argument throughout the essay, um, then goes on to go into quite a few, few bit, quite a, use, a good use of evidence here, uh, and uh, criticises uh, the reforms in the first paragraph. However, I do feel, and the examiner agrees, that the points are not very developed here, as a result it's not very analytical, and there isn't very good application to the question. It's not clearly, uh, it's not clear how they're ex explaining the, uh, this, uh, the explanations for differences in offending and criminalisation. The next paragraph's got lots in it, okay, like a wide range of theories mentioned and lots of evidence and statistics, uh, particularly on the offend, and it starts to address the offending element of the question. However, <clears throat> I do feel that this is more of a juxtapos juxtaposition evaluation. Um, however, right realists argue no real link to the previous arguments. Um, they really should develop the point they mention here about statistics um, um, blaming ethnic minorities, uh, not statistics being accurate. Um, <clears throat> It's good that they then go on to kind of talk about how, you know, right realists blame it on the culture of defend dependency. Uh, some good analysis of the concept, but could also use a sociological study here, Murray, perhaps. Uh, it also then goes on to evaluate their arguments, saying actually Asian families have very good family structures, but however they're still um, accused or seen as more criminal, particularly uh, male Asians. Uh, but the evaluation isn't very much developed. <clears throat> and it goes on again to talk about functionalism, so we've talked to cover like, uh, another theoretical perspective in here, with some contemporary examples there with David Cameron. Um, I do still feel that there, is n there isn't very clear application back to the question about uh, the differences in offending and criminalisation. Um, and I do feel the points are a bit undeveloped. And there isn't very, in fact, I don't think there are any actual sociological studies mentioned in that point. Okay, so good range of ideas there but perhaps not the depth and not as um, well applied and I don't think the evaluation is as strong as it has been previously. Uh, the next final paragraph, sorry, uh, they refer here to uh, differences in offending uh, are not the result of the criminal justice system, that's linking back to their arguments in the previous point, although they haven't made that explicit but that's still good. Ethnic minorities, um, and it goes on to say that yes, they do commit crime, but it's because of different uh, reasons. But they don't really develop these points, like you know, how does the formation of subcultures lead to um, crime? Um, yeah, and I think that the there is no clear conclusion here either, which is um, something that's worth considering. So that question there, I have some of my feedback and the examiner feedback on there. What mark would you give that out of thirty using the mark scheme? That's on the previous slide. Uh, sorry, the previous two slides, um, write your mark, and then have a go at marking your own 30 mark question when you've had a go at it. This question is your second 10 mark question. Uh, this time it's an outline and explain question, however. So, question 5, 10 marks, 15 minutes. That's straight from the mark scheme. Um, have a quick read through. Uh, the question is, outline and explain two reasons why sociologists might not influence government policy. So why are, might they not actually have any influence of policy makers? We've talked about that a lot in class. So um, it can be for a range of reasons there, as you can see. It's something to do, actually, the government's not interested in a sociolo sociologist's findings because it doesn't fit in with their ideology. They need to be very popular. Uh, right the way down to things like actually they might not be interested in the type of research methods they've used because they prefer quantitative data. I was trying to think of some studies and examples you could use here to illustrate how sometimes sociological research is ignored. So we know Dick Hobbs' research on uh, the nighttime economy, been drinking, for example. Uh, we haven't looked at this yet in class, but it's the short, sharp shock research that's found that this approach to juvenile detention centres of introducing military-style regimes wasn't having any positive effect on reoffending rates, but 
the Conservative government stuck with it because they felt it was popular with their electorates, even though it had very it didn't have any evidence of having any impact on reoffending rates. Arguably, left realist ideas aren't very popular at the moment. Doesn't fit in with the ideology of the current government. Um, <clears throat> Marxist research generally is never uh, uh, sort of accepted by government policymakers because Marxists are generally very critical of the government. Stuart Hall and Gilroy might be an interesting one to use, possibly purely because they their research in the nineteen seventies found that the police were racist and it was completely ignored. Uh, nothing was done about it. And you can compare that to the McPherson report um, following the Stephen Lawrence case, where the findings, were, well, there actually was an inquiry and there was a serious report written and the findings were taken into account. So Stuart Hall and Gilroy would illustrate that the government at the time, in the 1970s, wasn't interested. Okay, Whereas, however, social attitudes have clearly changed since then and the McPherson report was uh, put in place. Uh here is your mark scheme, top two bands, I haven't done the bottom one again. As you can see, unlike the uh, analysed 10 mark questions, sorry, apply from the item and analyse 10 mark questions, uh, it's only asking you to analyse. If you see AO3, there will be appropriate analysis. doesn't say anything about evaluation. Uh, <clears throat> but it is asking you to go into a bit more detail to get into the top band. So have a read through those, though, that top and middle band. And on the side... I've got an example answer here for you with the mark scheme. So again, have a read through. Do you think it's strong enough to get into the top band? Why? If not, have a go at thinking about what the EBI is. What could they do better here, do you think? And once you've done that, mark your own or attempt the answer and then mark your own. Your final question uh, is going to always, well, these last two questions will all be, always be theory and methods question. Uh, you need to read the final 20 mark question quite carefully to work out whether it's a theory or methods question. Okay, So this question, number six, which is applying material from item C and your knowledge, evaluate the useful of usefulness of interpretivist approaches to our understanding of society. 20 marks, spend 30 minutes. So in this particular case you have to let the item guide you. Okay, Interpretivism uh, is an approach to research but if you read the item it says it interpreters view of social reality as made up of meanings and motives. So it is guiding you to have some discussion about um, what types of uh, what theories for example and researchers would use uh, interpretivist approach to research. So I've uh, highlighted meanings and motives, and I also want to say, who, who was it who talked about, or who, which different um, interpretivist sociologists use symbols, uh, so, and talk about how symbols are, create a meaning. There's a couple of the different ones that you can talk about here. And what other interpretivist ideas uh, can you add, and how do they link together or challenge each other? So it is really worth thinking about this here, like... Um, Think about the symbolic interactionists would be interpretivists. Um, and then what other ideas might you want to use here and uh, possibly use to challenge each other? Maybe think about Goffman, Cooley, Mead. Um, <clears throat> think about a Becker, anything you can use to maybe challenge them. Uh, but keep a focus on the item, the idea about meanings and motives. Uh, to understand these meanings and motives, sociologists must be able to empathise with the people they study. So, this is guiding you now to talk more about the research methods element. So, empathise with the people they study. What is the key term that interpretivists use that say you need to gain empathy with your subject, see the world through their eyes? And can you remember the name of the sociologist that talked about that? Why do interpretivists see this as so important? Why is it so important to gain empathy? What do you gain from that? Think about the validity. Think about using those key words. And try and think of a study that really did this. Which study have we looked at in quite a lot of detail? Um, well, I'll tell you. It's that I'd ideally want you to use maybe Venkatesh here. Um, but that allowed you to really empathise with the people in the study. If not Paul Willis, possibly. Um, <clears throat> 
and you can AO3 this because it does say to evaluate the usefulness of interpretive sorry usefulness of interpretivist approaches. So what is a problem when you develop a lot of empathy with your research subjects? What do you lose according to positivists? That means that perhaps your your research is no longer uh, valid, professional, even research, so to speak. Then goes on to say, um, they furthermore interpreters argue that society can only be studied subjectively. This is giving you a hint towards value freedom. So how does this relate to the value freedom debate? Um, who said that it's impossible to study society without values? Try and think, and why did they say that? Um, but why do interpreters actually say it is important to use values in your research? What do your values help you do? But don't forget, if you do talk about value freedom, you must keep on linking back to the question uh, and the item talks about subjectivity and how actually, you know, how does that mean that interpretivism is useful? Interpretivist approaches are useful. But on the other hand, how does being really subjective, how is that actually a limitation of interpretivism? And therefore, they favour qualitative research methods of, uh, sorry, qualitative research methods. So, uh, what are the different examples of qualitative research methods? Can you think of any examples of studies that have used them? Um, one of the most, the best type of interpretivist research, arguably, is ethnomethodology. Um, what is ethnomethodology? Uh, can you think of any examples of ethnographic research, which would illustrate the interpretivist approach as well? And again, AO3. Why do you think doing really in-depth, rich, qualitative research, why does it actually make interpretivist approaches much less useful when we try and understand the whole of society? Because the question does say understanding of society and not individuals. Okay, so here is the 17 to 20 band uh, of the 20 mark question very similar to your 20 marks 20 mark mark schemes from your topics paper as well um, and I've picked broken it down into AO1 AO2 and AO3 skills okay so this is top band what you need to be aiming to do and I've highlighted in green the things you need to make sure so you know top AO1 a range of relevant material in enough depth okay that's important applicate material will be applied uh, uh, accurately and remember the question is the usefulness of interpreters approaches to an understanding of society. It doesn't just say researching society, it means understanding society. And uh, your AO3 analysis evaluation, evaluation must be developed, you know, with a debate between those different um, aspects of interpretivism, and analysis will be clear, okay? But don't forget, if your response is broad or deep, so one or the other, the maximum you can get is 16. If some of your points are not focused on the question, so oh, I don't know why that says social change, apologies. So if some of your points are not focused on the question, a maximum of 16. If your essay is list-like, uh, so, you know, just like one point, then another point, then another point with no links between them, maximum 12. If your essay is narrow, so hardly, not a very wide range of points, maybe, say, two or three, 12. If you use juxtaposition evaluation, which is a big no-no, maximum 12. So you can do everything else brilliantly. You can write a fantastically analytical essay. But if your evaluation points are really weak or the debate is quite limited, maximum 12. If you only discuss two points in depth or three points in no de and hardly any depth, your maximum will be eight. So you've got to be very careful here because this is the last essay on your paper. So you don't want to run out of time and do just two or three points here because you might end up just with eight out of 20. Um, and if there's no evaluation at all, you've just discussed uh, what's good about interpretivist methods, for example, or interpretivist approaches to understanding society, maximum of eight. And there are some of the concepts that uh, the uh, exam board have picked out that you might discuss in this particular essay. So same as before, here's an example response. Have a read through. What do you think? Pause it here if you need to. So here's the uh, essay again with the uh, examiner comments at the end. Uh, thinking about that first paragraph, even though it is quite lengthy and there are quite a few different names and ideas in there, so it says there are a range of sociological evidence and lots of concepts, it doesn't really go into much depth uh, that it could do. They missed a few opportunities, for example, uh, mentions there 
Goffman developed in his study of mental asylums? Well, what did he develop? How, what did he find out about labelling in mental asylums? Like, what a fantastic study just to skip over in one sentence. Um, there was a very brief bit of evaluation at the end, but there's not much uh, internal criticism going on within interpretivism up, up there, interpretive uh, approaches to society. Um, so, yeah, lots of ideas, lots of evidence, uh, lots of key names and concepts, but perhaps not the depth that they could require here and not as evaluative as it could be. Uh, second paragraph is very brief and it's very, uh, it's good, got, got some good evaluation points there, but again, doesn't explain it in much detail. So, you know, how did, was um, the hysteria used to control women? What was the point of it? Okay, why did it benefit men? And that particularly does link in with um, the suffragette movement, any of you who have studied the suffragettes more recently. The final paragraph, again, very detailed. Um, but not developed enough, okay? It does offer good evaluation, but it doesn't really develop the points in enough depth um, in order to kind of get into the top band, so there's a bit of a hint. Uh, the conclusion is not as clear uh, about which approaches might be combined. You know, I think they mean positivism and interpretivism, but they haven't said that explicitly. This could be clarified. The examiner here says the answer gives a broad range of points in the question, but has limited evaluation. I'd probably be a bit more critical and say uh, that there is a lack of analysis here. Um, the application isn't as strong as it could be either. Okay, so again, have a look at what mark you'd give it out of 20. Uh, have a look at your own essay. What would you give yourself out of 20? And we'll go through it together in class. Okay, thank you. Bye.